morning. Um, this webinar is part of what we call the National Hydrogen Sensitization and Promotion Project in Nigeria. Um, it's one of four webinars that we have designed to slowly introduce the topic of hydrogen and scale up the understanding of the potentials of, Ni of, of Nigeria's potential in the area of hydrogen. It is made um, of three other components of the program. As part of the project, we're also going to have um, public relations, the business day newspaper. And we're also going to have a working group that will develop a, uh, a white paper for, uh, to promote the, to kickstart the conversation around hydrogen in Nigeria and get the government and the private sector uh, interested in the topic of hydrogen to see that Nigeria has potential and to take further research into Nigeria's hydrogen potentials. Uh, we are pleased to inform you today that the project has been approved and endorsed by the Federal Ministry of Environment and the Federal Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Resources. And one more component that we hope to have, the virtual roadshow, where we invite German companies to meet with potential Nigerian companies and you know, try and work out how they can um, do projects together in the area of hydrogen. So we are hoping to have a very full gambit of uh, opportunities um, as part of this project. And we welcome you all for the ride. Um, without much ado, I will like to also mention that the German Foreign Ministry has other projects in the area of hydrogen that will be kickstarting this year, one of which is the um, hydrogen diplomacy project, and another is the geopolitics of the energy transmission project, uh, of the energy transformation project, sorry. Um, that that uh, geopolitics of the energy transformation project would also be present with us at our next webinar in September, and I hope that we are all um, will all be able to attend that one as well. So thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, I would like at this point to introduce Ms. Anya Beretta, the uh, Director of Regional Program for Energy Security and Climate Change in Sub-Saharan Africa of the Conrad Adenauer Foundation to give her welcome address this morning. Ms. Beretta, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Godwin, um, for this very warm welcome. And um, good morning, good day, good afternoon from wherever you're joining to to distinguished audience. Um, yeah, just uh, probably to, to also uh, address my welcome to, to this distinguished panel, uh, to Ms. Halima Bawa Buari, the Acting Director um, of Climate Change in the Ministry of Environment, and uh, Ms. Comfort Menu, Deputy Director of GAS, um, at the Federal Ministry uh, of Petroleum and Resources, and uh, Dr. Akbo, the lead coordinator of the uh, Hydrogen Atlas at uh, FZ Jülich. Um, I'm very pleased uh, to be here this morning, um, and I would just, you know, very briefly uh, introduce uh, Konrad Adenauer Foundation, um, my, my institution. We are based in Nairobi, but we are a regional program that works on energy security and climate change. Um, we are a non-technical organization. That means we focus more on um, the social and, and political framework to enable um, better um, climate change um, legislation, policy framing. Um, but obviously, we are also working a lot on the energy transition and how we can make that a success story for, for sub-Saharan African countries. And the reason why we're here this morning is because we believe that hydrogen um, is not only an essential component of the energy transition in industrialized countries such as, as Europe, but we also believe um, that it has an enormous opportunity for an economic uh, growth in on the African continent um, if it's done the right way. And that's, again, to some extent depends on the technical component, but it also depends on you know, the level of engagement, of involvement of the population and the level um, that African companies will be integrated into the whole value chain of hydrogen. Um, and this is very, very important to consider right from the start 
um, in order to make this really a, a win-win situation for African countries, but also for, for European countries and particularly for, for the African population. And it is no secret that Nigeria um, is one of the countries where um, you know, the questions of energy access and energy transition will play, uh, are already playing a, a big role, but will play an even more prominent role in the years to come. And I'm therefore very glad that we started this project uh, with the uh, German Chamber of Commerce in Nigeria. And I'm also very glad that uh, Dr. Akbo is here this morning to talk a bit um, about uh, the hydrogen atlas. And I'm also very much looking forward to hear from the representatives of the ministries, how we can create this enabling framework um, and really tap into all the opportunities that hydrogen can potentially offer to the African continent and this morning in particular to Nigeria. Um, I will just post my, my contact details in the chat box. I'm always happy for feedback, um, for one-to-one -one, uh, contact exchange after the seminar. So we are here, we are we're in Nairobi, but we also uh, do conduct a lot of activities in West Africa. So please do reach out to us. We're always very happy to, to hear from you. And without further ado, I hand over uh, back to Goodwin. Um, thanks again for having us. And I, I wish us all a very fruitful and interesting discussion this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anya. Um, right now we are going into the session where um, for the first keynote address to be delivered um, on behalf of the uh, His Excellency, the Federal Minister, uh, the, the Minister of Environment of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Dr. Uh, Mohammed Mahmoud Abubakar. Dr. Mohammed Mahmoud Abubakar was born on the 30th of December 1958 in Tunungwada, Kaduna State. He obtained his bachelor and master's degree in microbiology and natural resources management respectively, from Central Washington University, Ellensburg, and a PhD in watersheds management from the University of Arizona, United States. He has worked in various organizations as environmental health inspector, industrial hygienist, waste investigator, all in the USA. Apart from belonging to various professional bodies, he was a former member of the Cardinal State House of Assembly, the Deputy Director of Field Operations of the all Progressive Congress Presidential Campaign Council, the National Chairman Buhari Support Organization, Chairman Universal Basic Education Board. He is happily married with children. Today, Dr. Mohammed Mahmoud Abubakar is ably represented by the Deputy, uh, by the Director, Acting Director Gas of the De Department of Climate Change of the Federal Ministry of Environment, Mrs. Halima Bawa Buhari. Mrs. Buhari, it's a pleasure to have you here. Good morning all and I thank you. My name is Halima Bawari, the Acting Director, Department of Climate Change of the Federal Ministry of Environment. I am very honored and privileged to be at this event representing, as you have all heard, the Honorable Minister of Environment, Dr. Mohammed Mahmoud Abubakar. I will stand on the protocols already established by the two speakers before me. And I would crave the indulgence of this audience that uh, you may hear some extraneous noises that I can't really control from the office for which I am speaking from. But uh, please uh, do listen to what the Honorable Minister has to say to this gathering this morning as I deliver it thus. It is a great pleasure to be here to deliver this keynote address at this first edition of the Nigeria Hydrogen Future webinar series, which is titled Clean Energy and Sustainable Economic Growth, the Opportunity of Hydrogen for Nigeria. We are presently li living in a world that is threatened by the adverse effects of climate change. The impacts of climate change has a widespread effect on social and economic development affecting the climate sensitive sectors, including the energy sector. As you may all know, Nigeria has just revised and submitted her NDC and has pledged a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions from up to 20% unconditionally and up to 47% conditionally. 
This involves an increase of 30% 30, 30 economy-wide energy efficiency by 2030. With the Green Bonds Program, Nigeria started this March in 2017 through various renewable energy projects, which included an off-grid renewable energy micro-utility, REMU, and an energizing education program that we carried out in seven universities across the country. Energy transition is inevitable, so it would only be realistic for Nigeria to look at other energy sources that are cleaner <laughs> than the fossil fuels. For Nigeria to meet its climate change targets, we will have to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels and explore the use of alternative energy sources. This will pave the way for cleaner energy production and use, which will lead to reduction of GHGs with core benefits on human health and the economy. Energy efficiency, renewables, and direct electrification are becoming the bulk solutions to climate change. The use of hydrogen can be a part of these climate change solutions. Hydrogen technologies are carbon neutral and have a role in preventing climate change and facilitate the establishment of a possible future hydrogen economy. Though it's not yet available in the Nigerian market, it would be an area to explore. Promoters of hydrogen, for which the German government is currently a trailblazer, have identified various potential applications of the element for cutting carbon emissions. For example, it could be used to power long haul trucks and trains, airplanes, and other uses. However, it appears hydrogen technologies are quite expensive and in the absence of subsidies and financial support, costs become a barrier to the uptake of such technologies, especially in developing countries. Awareness, technology transfer, soft loans and grants may be the solution mix that will enable the wide use of such products globally. I thank you for your attention and I, seek, I wish you all a fruitful deliberation at this first edition of this meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mrs. Halima Bawa Buari. Um, you have delivered an excellent keynote address and set the tone for today's uh, session. Uh, I'm particularly pleased that you touched on the topics of, of the potential for hydrogen in Nigeria, which we will see um, in Dr. Agbo's presentation. Uh, <clears throat> without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Mrs. Comfort Emenbu. Uh, Mrs. Comfort Emenbu is the Deputy Director of Gas at the Federal Ministry of Petroleum and Natural That's Resources. Nice. Here today, she is representing uh, the, 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 the director of gas, engineer Mrs. Uh, Inkem Agolo, uh, and she will be delivering the second keynote address for this session. Mrs. Emendu? Good morning. Uh, I am Mrs. Comfort Emendu, deputy director of gas, representing my director of gas, who is unavoidably uh, absent on official assignment. She sent her greetings to the participants. She has also given me a paper to present on her behalf. And I would like to go straight to share the paper with the participants. Okay, what she has given me is a keynote address and we have, we have a paper, Diversification of Nigerian Energy Mix. 
the opportunity of hydrogen energy. Uh, so, I, I hope we are all on the same um, page. So she said, I should extend the Minister of Petroleum Resources greetings to all the participants. The willingness of the Minister of Petroleum Resources to collaborate with uh, the German uh, Chamber of Commerce with the uh, Corona and the No Foundation in ensuring that Nigeria transits to the new energy hydrogen energy uh, the ministry is very desirous and we are various and there is exactly talk about the education of the Nigerians energy, the opportunity of hydrogen energy. We have, you can see, brief outline of what we have. The world is moving towards reducing emissions. Most economies that are dependent on oil and gas will be affected. Nigeria is one such. As we all know that dependent on uh, fossil oil, really need to the and we can also look back and see how it has been. Um, for, uh, oil has transisted from different, different, you know, uh, when it started in the ancient time with the firewood, we have the coal, we have the oil, we have the natural gas, and then the renewable. All are taken from one stage to the other. Initially, firewood dominates. Gradually, to oil. Now, what Nigeria is trying to harness the most at the moment. This energy mix trying to achieve. Other activities drive the transi transition. And our policies, uh, we have also uh, noticed that our it is in the event are not yielding good results and so to diversify to move to another source of energy it will reduce the extent of devastation on our environment we also notice that with the advancement in technology there are form of energies that are even cheaper when we want to shift or to mix it with what we already have. We also, ministry in his have definitely to of and initiated national we have activities that we, which also we have the gas flare commercialization program, which was aimed to reduce the flaring that we are experiencing in the Delta. We also have the national gas program, encourages the utilization of gas and so many other foil, which this energy will feed in. Recently, we have the declaration of the decade of gas, all in an attempt to encourage the uh, energy mix and to shift from the fossil fuel to the more cleaner energy. 
Hydrogen is a clean energy carrier that can be used for various applications. It's also abundant in the universe. It is currently the largest, you can you get it largely in the natural gas. And the sources of hydrogen is easier to assess than even the fossil fuel that we spend so much to develop. We also acknowledge the fact that we use hydrogen for electricity, heat and production, for industrial application, for vehicle transportation, residential application and commercial application. And so introducing hydrogen to the energy mix of Nigeria is very, very key. We also notice that it has the advantages are all over the, the fossil fuel that we have been used to. It is readily available. It does not produce harmful emission. It is also environmentally friendly compared to fossil fuel. It is, that is very, very efficient. Therefore, we encourage this collaboration to enhance the development of hydrogen in Nigeria. I want us to look at the, the, the population of Nigeria currently, you know, from the World Bank statistics. Nigeria has the largest population in Africa and currently has a population of over 211 million. And estimated population to hit 401.31 million by 2050, according to the United Nations projection. This therefore means that there's available market for increased source of energy because the consumption of energy in Nigeria is increasing on daily and annually basis. It is therefore a welcome development for the hydrogen to be introduced among the sources of energy in Nigeria. You know, just to highlight some of the epileptic problems we have, like the electricity, we need the hydrogen to power the light to, to bring light to the Nigerian home at a cheaper cost. Uh, we also notice that uh, we Nigeria for, before now primary energy consumption from 2012 was very very high, and the development has been moving gradually. It's a very gradual space. You can look at it: 80% traditional solid biomass and just 13% oil, natural gas, just 6% hydrogen one. That was at 2012. But when you look at, as we move forward in 2017, there's great improvement. We have petroleum and other liquids, 55%, and natural gas, 42%. The renewable and solid biomass and waste are still at a minimal stage, which, with the introduction of hydrogen, it will also increase and reduce more of uh, petroleum and other lipids. Uh, we have said earlier that the implication of it, if we increase the volume of the new, the hydrogen into the fuel mix, we will have dependence or we will reduce the dependence of fossil fuel and we will have enough sources of energy that there will be competition. And when there's competition, it will reduce costs. And the uh, issue of in environmental problems will be reduced. And uh, the desire to switch to new sources of energy will be easy because the choice will be made available to the populace. Therefore, it is the desire of uh, the Minister of Petroleum Resources to collaborate effectively with um, the German industry of commerce, the delegation of German industry of commerce in Nigeria and the Koran Andino Foundation to ensure that hydrogen is accepted in Nigeria, is made uh, public in Nigeria, and policies are developed towards enhancing the utilization of hydrogen and also making it abundant to reduce the usage of fossil fuel in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, 
Mrs. Emenbu, um, we, we, we note that uh, there were technical difficulties during your uh, presentation, and we hope that uh, at the end of this webinar, uh, we are able to get uh, the speech, um, the keynote address that we will distribute uh, to attendees and also include as part of our um, public relations articles in the newspaper, in the Business Day newspaper. So thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Uh, MNB. Um, before I introduce uh, Dr. Solomon Agbo, who, has, uh, uh, who was the lead coordinator for a groundbreaking hydrogen project, I would like to um, note that we have over 100 participants uh, at today's webinar. This is no coincidence. It's, uh, I think it's, uh, it is a reflection of how important the topic is, not just, um, and how much interest there is for the topic of hydrogen in, in Nigeria. And as we go further, and as we go more and do more of these webinars and do the other aspects of this project, we will see an uh, increase in, um, in um, participation and more people will get uh, aware of this project. So um, at this point, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Solomon Agbo. Uh, he is the lead coordinator of the Hydrogen Atlas Africa project at the FC Ulish in uh, Germany. His presentation is titled Technical Potentials of Producing Green Hydrogen in Africa, Highlights from the Hydrogen Atlas Africa project. I remember at the start of this uh, webinar, I told you that we designed four webinars to take uh, our participants from a limited understanding of hydrogen to a more technical understanding of hydrogen. And now we're starting at the very ground. What is the potential for hydrogen production in Nigeria? That is the question that uh, Dr. Solomon Agbo will, um, will answer. So I hope you all pay attention to this revolutionary atlas that Dr. Agbo would uh, introduce to all of us. So, Thank you, Dr. Agbo, for joining us this morning. Thank you very much, um, Godwin. And I would like to say a very big uh, welcome to everyone that's on the platform. Um, I would like to appreciate the Honorable Minister for Environment, who is uh, ably represented by Mrs. Halima Baba Buari. Um, thank you for being here. I also would like to um, welcome, especially, the Mrs. Comfort Emembu, who is representing the Director of Gas at the Federal Ministry of Petroleum Resources. And um, special thanks also to Anya. Um, we've been in this together um, really from the very beginning. Thank you very much. I'm glad that uh, in the end, this is possible. And again, I would like to thank everyone who is on the platform. I mean, we are here because you, you are here. If you were not here, then this would not happen. So thank you very much for, for being here. And I'm really very, I'm, I'm personally really very, very excited um, in one way because I am involved in the topic and I understand really the potential that it holds uh, for, for the continent, for, for Africa, for Nigeria. But in another way, I am also excited because um, we are talking about Nigeria, the country where I come from. And so you, it's, it's really for, it makes the whole event for me really very special. So I will share my slides and then we will take it up from there. Um, please can someone confirm if you see my slides? I can see your slides okay. in presentation mode now. Yes, okay, thank you very much. So like Godwin said, I will talk about uh, the technical potentials of producing green hydrogen in Africa. And I will discuss this within the framework of the History of Last Africa project, which we have been working on for over one year now. Uh, my name is Solomon Abu, and uh, I work here at the Research Center um, Ulish in Germany. So like Godwin said, I will also give a bit of some basic information because I understand that um, a lot of us who are in the platform are also not uh, within the energy space and so the background will be, will be very important. So 
why are we actually talking about hydrogen? So hydrogen is the most prevalent element in the whole universe. It's really like everywhere. And at room temperature, it is gaseous. And when you burn it in oxygen, you just produce water. So basically, so water is the output when you burn um, hydrogen. And then there are various ways you can produce, you can produce uh, hydrogen from water, from fossil fuel, and then of course, from other sources. And this is something very interesting. It's, it has the highest energy content of any common fuel by weight. So whether you compare it with gasoline, for example, it has three times the energy content of gasoline. This is, this is quite uh, interesting. And how is hydrogen produced? So depending on how you produce hydrogen, it's also described with different colors. So we have what we call the green hydrogen, so which is in, in our context, really uh, what would be the focus. So this is hydrogen you produce really green. So produce green because you use renewable energy as your energy source, and then you use renewable energy to split water. So you do basically, basic, basically uh, electrolysis of water. So you split water into hydrogen and oxygen, and then you collect the, the hydrogen. So you use renewable energy, which can be PV, which can be wind, and sometimes also can be hydropower. So if that is the case, then we call this type of hydrogen, green hydrogen. And you can also generate hydrogen when you do what is called steam methane reforming. So basically you reduce methane. And in this case, you use natural gas or you can also use coal. And when you do this, you, you generate hydrogen. But then in addition to generating hydrogen, you also have CO2 emission. And when this is the case, we call this green hydrogen. So the problem with this is that you have CO2 emissions, and this is what we try to avoid. And then you also have um, the other type of hydrogen that is also generated from steam methane reforming. So when you reduce methane, using also natural gas as power source, but then in this case, instead of just emitting CO2, the, em the CO2 is emitted, but then this is also captured. So you do what we call carbon capture, which you can store which you can also reuse, which we can, of course, be also part of some other industrial processes. So when you produce hydrogen this way, this we call blue hydrogen. And then there is the other one that is the Tokyo's hydrogen. So in this way, you, do, you basically generate hydrogen from pyrolysis of methane. And then again, you use natural gas, you know, where you split methane, you generate hydrogen, and then you have a solid uh, carbon as an additional byproduct. So these are basically like the very basic um, ways by which hydrogen can be produced. And then this has been classified also to have the different colors of hydrogen. But when we speak particularly with regards to green hydrogen, because this would be our focus. So like I said, it is green because you are using renewable energy as your energy source. So like you see in this diagram, so you have renewable energy, you have a, a, what we call an electrolyzer, so which is really like a complete, uh, uh, like a, a cell composed of two electrodes, an anode and a cathode, and then you have within this an electrolyzer. So when you, when you pass um, direct current, which you generate from renewable energy, you are able to break down the water molecule. So you have hydrogen, you have oxygen, which you can of course uh, take out from the system from the two electrodes that you have. Uh, within the setup. So this is basically how hydrogen is generated. So this is green because you use water, which is green. Then you also use renewable energy, which is also green. And this is why we call this um, green hydrogen. And then going forward, so for us um, within our project, and of course for, for us uh, as a country in Nigeria, our focus really should be on green hydrogen because this has benefits in one way, of course, for sustainable energy production, but of course, in the other way, it helps us to address the issue of climate change. So when you talk about hydrogen, um, there are, uh, apart from just hydrogen, there are several other derivatives or other um, value products that can be derived from hydrogen. So one, you can use hydrogen directly. So if you use hydrogen directly, whether you can use this to generate electricity. So in, this, in which case you have to have a turbine, which is hydrogen driven. You can also use hydrogen to generate heat. I'll talk about this uh, a little bit uh, later. So in this case, this heat is generated as a byproduct when you burn hydrogen in the fuel cell. So you generate heat, which can also be utilized in Europe, for example, for house heating. But then you can also use hydrogen together with some other 
compounds or some other 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 elements to generate some other byproduct, some other derivative. So, for example, you can combine hydrogen with nitrogen. So, you take nitrogen from from atmosphere, and then you generate ammonia. So, ammonia you can use for for fertilizer production. You can also use um, hydrogen together with CO2 that you capture also from the atmosphere and then you generate some other byproducts. So methane is one, methanol is also two. And these are also uh, synthetic fuels that of course can be used in several uh, industrial sectors. So some of which would include, for example, so you have, like I talked about before, so whether it is for power generation or for heat generation, you have huge potential to use um, green hydrogen. You are, of course, as an, as in the, within the industry, so whether it is ammonia or whether it's a, a synthetic gas or hydrocracking and all of that. So several processes in the industry where you have a huge potential also to use hydrogen. And of course, within the, 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 the transport sector, there is huge, huge really. So there are hydrogen driven cars, which there are cars that are based on fuel cell. So fuel cell is basically a cell that has a possibility to, to burn hydrogen with oxygen to generate uh, electricity. So whether it is a fuel cell, whether it is hydrogen direct, cars that are directly powered by hydrogen, whether they are, they are in also even aircrafts and trains and all of that. So there are huge possibility in several sectors where hydrogen would have um, a big impact to make. Just like I talked about, so when you burn hydrogen, for example, so you have a fuel cell, if you have hydrogen, you combust this in oxygen or in air within a fuel cell, you have two products. So one is water, which is beautiful because this has no problem with our environment. And then the other product is uh, you have a waste heat, which can also be harnessed. So you have um, a possibility to collect this heat and then use this for to supply either to buildings like it's done here in Europe. But then the big part of the combustion of hydrogen it's the fact that you generate direct current. So which you can directly use. So if you have um, a load that is DC powered, so you can directly use the, the direct current you get from the fuel cell to power this. But then you can also trans, uh, uh, convert this using an inverter to an AC power and then use it also to power an AC load. So this is basically how um, a fuel, this works. Just to give us an idea of a projection of how the use of hydrogen will grow over the years. So we currently, you have application mainly in refining and then in, within the industry, but over the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, that this is going to grow very rapidly. So it's already estimated that, for example, within the transport sector, there's going to be several folds growth in the use of uh, green hydrogen. The same also for a synthetic fuel or even in ammonia production, which can be very useful for further production of fertilizer for agricultural uh, purposes. So this in what I have, so basically there is no doubt that um, hydrogen will play a very key role in various sectors of the economy of any nation that really ventures. And um, it just makes sense really that um, in one way this provides possibility for sustainable development for sustainable energy production but then in the other way holds a lot of uh, prospects because it helps to address the issue of climate change so i will zero in a little bit now to talk a bit about the h2 atlas project and then some of the things that um, we have also found out with regards to potential with regards to opportunity that exists for Africa, but also for Nigeria in particular, with regards to hydrogen. So we started this project basically to, to, look, to look at the potential of generating green hydrogen in Africa. So looking at the technological, but also the environmental, socioeconomic feasibility assessment. So this we, we, we started, so this project has been funded by the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research. And so the research is coordinated and led from uh, a team of scientists. Um, so within our research center here in Ulish, so we have like 17 scientists that we work together within this project as the lead technical partner. But then we work together with, uh, we have partners in Africa. So the whole of, actually the whole, the 15 ECOWAS countries are 
partners in this project. So in each country, we have um, a team that supports us also within this project. But then this, this whole, all the countries in West Africa are coordinated from, from WASCAL. So WASCAL is also a BMBF supported center that is in Ghana. So in Southern Africa, we also have within the 16 uh, SADAC countries. So we have in each country also a, a project team. And then that is also coordinated by the Southern Africa uh, Science Service Center for Climate Change and Land Use. So we have also the other uh, energy efficiency centers of ECOWAS and SATSI that are also part of the project. So our main aim basically is to create a database. Want to show, want to, to want to, evaluate the possibility of generating green hydrogen in West and Southern Africa using basically renewable energy. And this is on the understanding that um, if we have to address the issue of climate change, it has to be through sustainable uh, energy sources that would also lead to sustainable development. So this is basically what the project is all about. So like I said earlier, so these are our focus countries and partners. So we have all the ECOWAS countries are involved. And then we have also the SADC countries in Southern Africa that are also involved in the project. And within our research center here in Yulish, so we have five different institutes that are involved. So we are, our research center is, has huge uh, expertise in the field of uh, renewable energy research and uh, related climate uh, research as well. So we have in total about um, 15 different uh, institutes that are doing different that are doing research in different aspects of renewable energy so a number of these institutes are also involved within this project uh, here in our research center so i try to to identify the institutes so you have the pv institute we have um, system analysis and technology evaluation so we have um, the agrosphere institute so that's looking at water availability so a number of um, our institutes that are involved in this uh, project. So one big question, so why Africa? So why, why is our focus in Africa, in the H2 Atlas Africa? So this is clear. One is that we have resources in Africa. So resources in one part, if you talk about renewable energy potential, this is huge in Africa. I will show you, I will give you numbers uh, shortly. So in one part, we have huge renewable energy potential. We also have a vast land area. So this is very important. So the land area of Africa can fit the US, can fit uh, Europe, can fit China, can fit India all together in, in, in uh, just Africa. So I will show you, I will also tell you shortly why this is very important with regards to green hydrogen production. So resources wise, yes. And in terms of that also, I would like to mention that we have also huge resources in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, human resources. So here you see a graph that shows the median age distribution within Africa. So if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, uh, you would see that you have a median age that is less than 20. So this is, this is a huge potential. So you have a lot of young people who can of course be part of the market who are also going to drive the technology in the years and years to come. And of course, in the other hand, you also have resources in terms of water. So we have um, yeah, lots of uh, water bodies where you would have possibility to generate, to have water, which you need of course for green hydrogen production. I will get back to this. Uh, um, later. But then in terms of business opportunities, it's a, you have also a lot of prospects in Africa. So over the last uh, few years, the global GDP has been driven by GDP of, uh, you know, the developing economies, especially in Africa. So there is a great uh, future that if Africa really plays a role in the, in the global green hydrogen economy, that this would not just for Africa, but for the entire globe, this would be um, this will make a lot of impact. So there is a huge market with regards to green hydrogen technology in Africa. So just to, to give you a bit of an understanding of what we have done within the project. So we, we have tried to break down our analysis, um, look, taking a lot of criteria into consideration. So one, we looked at the process chain that you would have to get through to produce hydrogen. 
Then the second thing we had to do was to do a basic assessment criteria. So in this way, we look at the land eligibility assessment. So you do an assessment to find out which portion of land, which land area within the region can be utilized to generate green hydrogen. This is very important because you have to take care that you do not um, use land that is reserved for agriculture or land that is, that is reserved for, for residential building to generate um, green hydrogen. So we took all of that into consideration. Then we did a, what we call a renewable energy potential assessment. So where you have to look at, so when you, when you do a land eligibility assessment, then you place your renewable energy infrastructure. So once you determine how much land is available that can be utilized, then you do an assessment of your renewable energy potential. So in this case, at this level in this project, we just, we are limited to PV and wind. So wind here includes both onshore and offshore. But in the future, uh, we intend to extend also to hydropower because a number of the West African countries, including Nigeria, has huge potentials from hydropower. But then, so the next thing we do is then to place our infrastructure. So like I said, so you place your infrastructure for green hydrogen generation. So once you determine the eligible land and then you do a renewable energy uh, assessment, then you can place your infrastructure. Once you place your infrastructure, then you determine, you put, you take into consideration what we call the local demands. So you determine um, what would be the, look at looking at the local scenarios. We, you look at how you would incorporate this into your hydrogen generation. So whether you use part of the renewable energy to provide local energy access, or whether you would use this also to, to support uh, the local industry. But these are details we, we work out with our partners in the different country. But it is important to stress here that uh, for, for what we have done to look at the potential, we have really um, engaged locally with the local stakeholders to make sure that um, we incorporate the local preferences and the local scenarios because they differ from, from country to country. And so we have here, so here you see a bit of details. So I, I would not uh, bore you to look at this, but just to mention that um, we try to not just focus really on the technical aspects, but we try to also look at some other socioeconomic or sociocultural factors that could affect um, green hydrogen production. So this is very important for us because we want at the end to be able to, to generate results that really shows how much potential exists without um, yeah, not without having aspects that are not uh, taken into consideration. So things like um, the local energy situation, like, like I talked about, we also looked at the, the, the infrastructure, the logistics that are available, if you have to transport or if you have to, to export um, green hydrogen, then we also have looked at another very important thing that we are, we are also looking at actually currently within the project. We're looking at the influence of climate change on resources. So this is very important, you have water, you have um, you have wind, you have PV. So what happens in fifty in fifty years from now, in hundred years from now, with climate change uh, scenarios or climate uh, development? Is there any way this affects water or other resources, land, and so on? So this is very important, and we have built this into our project. So in all of this, we developed within our 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 research center an analytical uh, algorithm. So we have an algorithm where we we are able to break down all of the things I have talked about into different work packages, and then we do an analysis. So we have the first part where we collect all the relevant data. So some of the data we collected are uh, open source data. Some of them also we collected from our partners in the different countries together. And then we broke down all of this into different work packages. So we have one part, for example, work package one, where we look at the social political context, then we have work package on land eligibility, renewable energy assessment. Then we have the future climate development and all of that, as you can see. Then we have water availability, we have local demands. So we put all of this in our model. And then in the end, we generate um, results that we show the amount of hydrogen that can be generated, but also uh, the cost. And we represent this in form of an interactive atlas that um, shows really where the potentials are. So just to give you an example of what we do in terms of uh, land eligibility. So this is, this, is basic, this is an example of an assessment that we do just to make sure that we, we stay within 
um, we do not overestimate or also we do not underestimate potentials that exist in the different countries. So for land eligibility, for example, we, we make sure that we take away roads, railway, airports, farmland, commercial areas, industrial areas, settlements, and all of that. So some of this information we can find in open source data, but a lot of them we collected from our partners in the different countries so that we make sure that we do not have um, a land use conflict because you have to place infrastructure to generate hydrogen and you should not have conflict with land for agriculture or land that is um, reserved for some other purposes. So this we have taken care of. So what we have delivered at the end is one, we have a techno-economic system, optimized system that shows how you can generate green hydrogen, that shows also um, the routes from where this can be exported. So if you're interested in exporting, for example, to Germany or to some other parts of the world. And then we have also, we have also determined the quantity of green hydrogen that can be generated. So in Nigeria, for example, or in several parts of the parts of um, Africa, where we, that is within the focus, we have also been able to quantify how much green hydrogen can be generated in per um, kilometer, uh, square kilometer area of, of land within the country, but also uh, from the whole, from the region as a whole. We have also been able to determine the cost. How much does would a kilo of uh, green hydrogen cost in terms of production in Nigeria, in Ghana, or in the other parts of the world? And another, another thing we have also done is that we have these results. Like I said, they are put in an interactive atlas. So I will show you the website shortly. So you could see um, where the potentials are. You could, you could see the hotspots. I mean, what we call the, the hydrogen hotspots. So where you would have the hotspots to generate green hydrogen in terms of quantity, but also in terms of, uh, of cost. So that's what we, we have as deliverable within the project. So just before I get to the end, I would like to show you some of the results that we have already from, from the project. And then you could also see, um, you, I mean, you could see um, Nigeria also within this picture. So the first big result that we have is that we have plenty of land. I use the word plenty. We have a lot of land available for renewable energy generation. This is really, uh, this is a map of West Africa. This is across West Africa. So you see Nigeria, for example. So you have huge possibility for PV all over. You also have huge possibility for onshore wind. This was something we found really very surprising that in many of the locations, many of the countries in West Africa, you have huge potential for onshore wind generation. And this is, this, this is still, um, largely untapped. So this is very interesting uh, results. So these potentials are huge. Now, the second thing that I also found really very interesting, we have been able to estimate the cost of generating renewable energy. So whether you use open field PV or onshore and offshore wind. So a typical example from, from, from West Africa, also including Nigeria, you have the levelized cost of electricity for as low as two cents, two euro cents per kilowatt hour. Two euro cents per kilowatt hour. This is incredibly, incredibly cheap. As cheap as you could really get. This is hard to beat from anywhere in the world. So this is huge potential for West Africa, including Nigeria. And then you see also that if you go to onshore wind and then offshore wind, the, the cost increases. And of course, this increases because um, yeah, the, the wind condition is not quite optimum for the existing uh, wind turbines that are in the market, but this could change in the future. So there would be possibility to have more and more, des more, and more designs that could suit the, the, the local wind condition in West Africa. But for PV, this is already a whole lot that's available. So this is, uh, we, we have also, uh, uh, suggested from our research that its preference should be given to open field PV to, to expand the possibility because this is huge within the country. So it's huge in terms of quantity, but it's also pretty cheap and should be, be harnessed. Now, the third big 
result that we found from this project is we have a huge green hydrogen potential. I want to put this in terms of numbers. So we have about 860 picowatt hour. This is 860,000 terawatt hour of green hydrogen that can be generated from across West Africa. So this is if we assume that we do not have any local water constraint. So for this project, we have focused so because like I said earlier, to generate hydrogen from renewable energy, you would need to split water. So you necessarily would need water. So for this research, we have, for at this stage, we have focused on using groundwater. So we did a groundwater availability assessment and we have, for this analysis, for this result you see here, we have assumed that there is no groundwater constraint. So you have groundwater for all of the production, for all of the renewable energy that's available for green hydrogen production. And this is a huge potential, huge, if you understand really um, this in terms of numbers, 160,000 terawatt hour of green hydrogen from across West Africa. And we have done this just using about 75% of this uh, energy source as coming from open field photovoltaics. This is incredible. Now, I would like to also mention, we, we found out that if you, if you do this assessment based on the amount of groundwater, so like I said, we did a groundwater assessment to look across the region, look so we did uh, groundwater assessment, but then also we had to do um, what we call the yield assessment, sustainability assessment, just to make sure that uh, you take into consideration the fact that the, the groundwater aquifer has to be recharged. Then you also take into consideration the fact that there are also other uses of this groundwater, maybe for local consumption and other uses. So we took all of that into consideration. And then we found out something also very striking for us in our project. So we found out that the, the hydrogen potential will be so much limited if you base the production just on groundwater. So in terms of numbers, you would limit the potential by 80%. So what I talked about earlier, 160 picowatt hour will be reduced by 80% from across the whole of ECOWAS, for example, if you were to depend just on groundwater. So we started to think about this, and then we did some, some further analysis I will just mention. So one thing, one way out of this is to use um, other sources of water. For example, we could use desalinated seawater. And our analysis shows that this would only increase the levelized cost of hydrogen by just about 0.5 to 0.7 percent. So very, very, very infinitesimal. So this is this is interesting to note that going forward, so that's the next thing we are also doing in the project. We are currently analyzing um, in terms of numbers, looking at all the possible places where you can get uh, seawater and then for possibility to desalinate that can be used for green hydrogen production instead of uh, groundwater so that we can leave out um, the fresh groundwater that can, so that this can be used by the local people for water consumption and then of course for all the other water uses. So in terms of numbers, so we found out that the cost of hydrogen, so the costs in terms of numbers of green hydrogen in West Africa ranges to around, around we have two euros per kilogram of green hydrogen. So if you do not, as if you assume that you do not have any ground water constraints, but you see that this is really like um, scattered. So you have different hotspots, but largely up uh, the north of West Africa. So you have like Niger, Mali, and some of those places where you have really huge um, hotspots for generating green hydrogen. But of course, within Nigeria also, you see that there are several scattered hotspots where the, the cost of hydrogen production is quite uh, within this uh, two euro per kilogram range. And the last but not the least, we also did a simple analysis to look at the, the socioeconomic impact this can make. So in terms of increased energy access, in terms of stimulating economic activities, in terms of even population redistribution. 
So to stabilize that you don't have, you know, always this rural to urban migration, if you have possibilities to generate green hydrogen from across um, the places. So you see in Nigeria, for example, actually across the whole of West Africa, the biggest impact in terms of uh, all of what I have mentioned is act will actually be felt in Nigeria across, whether you go from north to south, east to west, huge impact that hydrogen has to make in Nigeria, for example. So this is very important to to highlight. So there are several other things that we have found within the project that I really would not have time to show you all of that here. But we have here our project website. So the Atlas is already online. So you can go to the website. You can go to the Atlas yourself, put any location you are interested in, in Nigeria or in any other part of West Africa. And then you would see all, there are several information there related to water, to electricity, to several, several layers with several information. So you can just, you can look at the hotspot. So all those details you would find on our project web, website. So if you get to the website, you would see a link to the Hydrogen Atlas tool. And then when you get there, you would be able to play with the Atlas and then you see all the information. So you can also um, get back to us. So if, if there are, something you do not understand or something you 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 would want to see that you think you are not seeing please um, feel free to contact me anytime and then we will we will take it up from there so like i said a lot more information you can find online on the atlas i will have several recommendations to make um at the end but i will really just stop at one because i really do not have all the time but i do, i just want to make one recommendation, which I want to believe that uh, we would take this with us um, as a country. And that's one, we need to start now, not tomorrow. If there is anything we have to do as a country to promote, to, to really start to develop green hydrogen, in Nigeria, if there's anything we have to do, it has to be now. We have to start now. We really have to start now. And I tell you why. I live in Germany. In the last couple of years, a number of German nuclear power plants, coal power plants have been shut down. It's not just in Germany, so many other countries are doing the same. It's all in a race to save our climate and also in a race to go for sustainable energy sources. Nigeria cannot afford not to be part of this now. Hydrogen is the oil of the future. And this is why there is a huge global green hydrogen movement. Just check through the internet, huge, huge, huge movement. Countries are discussing partners, international cooperation, agreements, people are striking agreements, signing MOUs, signing partnership to generate green hydrogen to export and all of that and all of that. Nigeria as a country has huge potential in this area. We have a lot of land like I have shown, we have huge potentials to generate green hydrogen, which we can use locally, but which we can also export. And we cannot afford not to be part of this momentum now, this movement now. It's, it will be more difficult to join when others have already taken off. I, I say this because uh, I, am, I am privileged to know a number of countries in Africa, for example, that are already really as in really striking deals, agreements, cooperation agreements with countries in Europe, in other parts of the world, in terms of hydrogen technology. And Nigeria as a country should not be left out. So if there is anything you would take home, I hope that uh, our ministries and the relevant government agencies that should play a role, should really play a role here. Technology-wise, and that's our part, it's clear, the potentials are huge, but technology will not stand alone. We need the enabling environment, we need the enabling policies, we need the enabling leadership from, from the relevant stakeholders from the government 
to make this happen. So I say again before I stop, please, we don't have to wait to join others later. We have to be part of the movement now that all other countries are joining. And we are very privileged that we have Germany as a country, for example, that is very much interested in partnering with us. And that's why um, we have Anya here from the Conrad Adenauer Foundation. We have our research center here in Julich. We have the BMBF, the German uh, Ministry of Energy and Research, um, Education and Research, that are also interested in partnering with Nigeria. And I think we have to make this happen now. Okay, so I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have questions, then we can discuss this uh, at the appropriate time. Thank you for your attention. Back to you, Godwin. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for a really enlightening presentation. Um, um, before we go into the question and answer uh, segment, um, I would like to encourage everyone to uh, go around, go, go on the Atlas. I don't know, Dr. Ago, if you can uh, stop sharing your screen and put the link for the, um, for the uh, Atlas in the chat so that everyone can actually click on it now and go on the Atlas and, you know, play around with it because it's a revolutionary uh, tool that actually enables you immediately start to see the potentials for hydrogen. Here at the AHK, we have several uh, activities around uh, the topic of hydrogen that's planned where we want to, um, where we want to really look at the potential uh, of hydrogen, especially in off-grid applications. So um, we have a lot of activities around that um, this year, next year, uh, and then we would also be sharing our results with you as well. Um, thank you once again, Dr. Agbo, for your presentation. Um, I, I don't know if you could just give us short answers to some of these questions that have, we have uh, received. Uh, the first comment is, let's be honest, Nigeria must use its massive uh, reserves of LNG, thus gray and blue hydrogen is what investors may be in a utility scale. Do you agree or disagree, Dr. Agbo? Um, thank you. Yes, I, 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 I do not agree. I think that, um, yes, we would, you would say because we have natural gas, you would prefer to, to go blue. But the truth is that the demand for this will only continue to decrease over time. It cannot, it, it will only last for, the end is actually in sight. So we have to be, we have to be, we have to be very realistic. So yeah. yes, for now you can, but not for too long from now. So you, it will be difficult to find partners. It will be difficult to, it will not be sustainable, simply put. It will only last for a while. And this, this would be a problem. It's a big issue, of course, for an environment. And as more and more countries strive to, to meet up their, their, their carbon containment, we will, it will be more and more difficult really to find partners if we have to continue in the business as usual. Yeah. My, my, my bet is by the end of this decade, we would already start to see that real, real steep decline begin. So um, I think everyone should have an eye on the future as well. Another comment I have here is desalination is still very expensive. It's only possible on coastal countries. Um, do you agree that desalination is still expensive? No, no. So I, I shared in, the, in one of my slides that the assessment that we did within the project, we found out that when you desalinate, you increase the, the production cost of hydrogen only increases by 0.5 to 0.7 percent. So this is this is this is really really small. And one other thing we are we we have uh, included in the desalination is what we call a co-benefit. So you desalinate not just for for green hydrogen production, but then you also desalinate for the local consumption so for use of the local people so in this way you really you 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 have uh, then you the, the cost in terms of uh, value even goes further down so it's it's you can also check from other studies but also from our study 
the, the, the cost of desalination is not, um, it's not huge. The only thing I must say here is that if you have to take, so if for, for, for countries that are landlocked, for example, where you would have to then transport water across borders or something like that, then the cost implication this wise can increase. But where you have a possibility um, to not, to get water without having to travel several hundreds of kilometers, uh, it's the cost implication is really, really uh, minimal. Okay. We well, have another question here. How can the participation in green hydrogen projects be raised in Nigeria considering the associated costs? Yeah, so just to, just to say, you know, in the last 20 years ago, 30 years ago, what we are talking about today about green hydrogen was also said about PV. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, no, PV is not the way to go. It's too expensive. Nobody can talk about it. It's not true anymore. PV is cheaper than electricity you generate from the other conventional energy sources. So the co and it will leave, I, wish, I didn't have time, maybe in, in the next series, I will show you the projection we made for the next 50 years. I showed you here the PV, two cents, our projection into the next 50 years, it will come down to one cent. One cent per kilowatt hour. That is, that is 50 years. 100 years from now, it's, it will be. So the same is true of hydrogen. The same is true of hydrogen. Yes, people are working day and night on technology, electrolyzers, for example, and all of those things to bring down the costs. And it will not take a long time. Give it the next 20, 30. Give it 20 years from now. You would see a huge drop in the price. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. It said about any new technology that comes on, at first the cost goes up. I mean, everyone in Nigeria can remember the price they paid for their first GSM phone, right? <laughs> any new technology, the price first starts up and then it comes down. Natural market uh, dynamics. Uh, Dr. Agu, is... Hydrogen from seeing gas uh, obtained from waste to energy gasification plants considered green? Yes, I think um, waste to energy, yes. So okay. if, if the power comes from waste, actually then it's, it's, it's green. Yeah. Um, one question here says, what are the main deciding factors in determining the appropriateness or inappropriateness of a land for green electricity development? I think he means green hydrogen development. And I think you yeah. answered that in your presentation. Yeah, I will so, share the presentation. I think we'll share the presentation. So um, the uh, yeah. person who asked the question. Maybe, maybe just to, to clarify. So that's why, you know, I, I mentioned that we, we, we took this really very seriously. So we had a lot and a lot of discussion with our partners in the different countries. And this is very important because, like I said uh, in, during the presentation, we do not want to overestimate. So if you use land that you should not. So if you have a building in a particular place and then you, you assume that that land is free and then you use all of that to calculate your land available for infrastructure, then at the end, your result will be an overestimation. Yeah. And on the other hand, also, you do not want to underestimate. So, you want to, so we want to really be driven by science. And that's why we did a lot of consultation with our partners. So any land that is not, um, of course, it has to be, in terms of elevation, it has to be such that um, you would be able to place your infrastructure. But then it has to be also such that it's not, it's not a reserved place. You don't, it's not for... I mean, all of the things that we looked at, you have to exclude all of that. And then you say, this land is free. Then there you can use that as part of your renewable energy potential assessment. Otherwise, then this would not fit. Okay. Um, another question says, how does a PhD candidate interested in hydrogen research participate in this project? Uh, I think the person can get in touch with you directly if you put your email address in the chats. Yes, so that the person can send an email to you. One more question here says, from the presentations of government representative, one common concern is presented is the high cost of hydrogen technology. Your presentation is not able to, as, not able to present a comparison with other energy sources. I think the person is asking why 
you didn't uh, compare the cost of hydrogen production to the cost of PV, uh, maybe electricity production, you know, prevent the comparative. Okay, thank you very much. So if you, I mentioned uh, that hydrogen has various applications. So if, if you are interested in energy access, because for different countries, for Nigeria, for example, we still have issues with energy access. So you have like 50% of our population still without access. So if, if the target is to increase energy access, then we can just generate from renewable energy using PV, for example, and supply. But beyond increased energy access, there are several other values that you get from hydrogen that you do not... Um, you cannot directly compare with electricity costs from PV. So take, for example, if you, if you generate hydrogen and then you take nitrogen from the atmosphere and you produce ammonia, then you use this to produce a fertilizer. So this is a completely different ball game. Or you generate hydrogen and then you use this for, for in the transport sector. So there are several um, big buses that are already being driven by hydrogen in, in the Western world. So in several of these other added values, you cannot make a direct comparison with electricity. But I have just tried to compare the cost of generating uh, renewable energy in Nigeria, for example. You have around two euro cents. This in Naira would be, I don't want to be wrong, but you can also do the calculation yourself. But yeah. this, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is incredibly, incredibly Cheap. Yeah, and I think we, we need to we need to we need to we don't need to wait any longer. We need to harness it. Yes. Um, um, one present one question says, how do we work together to get the government on board to put forward a policy framework and open the economy to explore the potentials of green hydrogen? Uh, to the question, and maybe I should answer that. The answer is that is what the goal of this project is in terms. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we hope to achieve with this project, to get the government on board, to get the private sector on board, and let's work together to get a policy going uh, that can get the government to explore, the, the country to explore its hydrogen potentials. Um, one question says, can the water produced be recycled? I'm thinking this question refers to the water produced from hydrogen production. Oh, he means, oh, I meant reused to produce heat. Okay, so the question is, can the water produced be reduced to produce heat? You mean, um, yeah, so the, the, the water you can harness, actually you can, you, you have, you extract the heat. So if you use, for example, um, for example, uh, if you're using fuel cell, so you have you have hydrogen and oxygen, you generate, you have water as a byproduct, and then you have heat. So the water, of course, can be collected for other use. Yeah, yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure who this question is directed to. It says, when are you coming to East Africa? I'm not sure who it's directed <laughs> to, so I think, I don't think we should answer that. Maybe I would answer. <laughs> yes, actually, it's, uh, so it's in the, we, we, we started with West and Southern Africa because, um, I mean, we have partners existing in these countries, but we are, we are, we are finalizing discussion to, to start also in East Africa. So we have um, Anya in East Africa, in Nairobi. So we, 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 are, we, are, we are already in discussion together with our funding ministry to make this possible. So this, this would be possible. We would explore also East Africa, North Africa, and then also Central Africa, so that we, in the end, we have a complete picture for the whole um, region. Okay. The last question here is the, I think, the most interesting question. Uh, I think it is quite interesting because one of the, um, one of the studies we are doing this year uh, has shown us that the use of solar PV in manufacturing industries in Nigeria is on the rise. Everybody knows that. A lot of companies are adopting it, putting solar PV on their roof, putting it um, for in, in factories, in shopping malls, it's on the rise. So the, and this question says, in the industries, we need cheap, efficient, and reliable power for the operations of factory equipment. How would hydrogen generation help in this area apart from the storage of some industrial products? Now, I think that this is actually a beautiful question because I think this is the next level of research that needs to be performed. 
how can we generate hydrogen on site and consume it on site as well? So uh, I don't know, um, Dr. Ago, can you take this question as well? Yes. Okay. Yes, that's interesting. I I didn't um, actually. I had this in, the, in in part of my my slides, but then I took it away because I felt uh, um, I I would not have within the time allo allocated to me, I would not be able to to explore that. Yes. So you have possibility to store hydrogen. You can store hydrogen. Then you also have a possibility to transform hydrogen to other values and utilize whenever you need. So there are several ways you can do this. So for example, there is what we call uh, uh, liquid organic uh, hydrogen carriers. So these are, these are like uh, compounds that you, you use hydrogen to, you react them with hydrogen. So you do what we call a hydrogenation process. So you use hydrogen to react with those compounds and then they store, they keep the hydrogen in them. Then when you need them, you do a reverse process. You do a dehydrogenation and then you take the hydrogen out again from those compounds. So they are called the uh, um, hydrogen carriers, organic hydrogen carriers. So this is one way you can store hydrogen. So there are also possibilities to liquefy, I mean, to, to liquefy and store. But apart from that, the, the, I think that one, one very common option is really to utilize, to utilize on production. So depending on what you want to do with it. So if you want, for I, I know I am, I'm, I'm, I, I mean, a discussion with a company in Zimbabwe. They are producing um, ammonia from hydrogen. So they generate hydrogen. Then they have a possibility they take nitrogen from the, from the atmosphere. Then they generate ammonia. And then they process further to generate fertilizer, which is it's, it's something that is used not just in Zimbabwe, but within the region. So depending on what you want to, to use, want to, what, what you are generating for, if you're generating for an industrial process, then you can, you can just directly use on generation. But if you're generating for, to use at a later time, then you have to think about uh, the other storage options, whether you use the, an, an LOCHC or you compress and all of that. Okay. Um, given the, that we are already bang on time, uh, I, 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 I would, really um, ask that, and there are so many questions still coming in and comments still coming in. Uh, I will really ask, I beg that uh, we um, postpone these questions for the next uh, webinar in the series. We are targeting to hold it by the end, the last week of September, knock on wood, um, uh, and you'll be um, informed about that as well. Like I told you at the start of this webinar, what we have designed is to take everyone from a limited understanding of hydrogen, Nigeria's hydrogen potential, to a more technical understanding of Nigeria's hydrogen potential. And that is what we hope to continue for the remaining three webinars in the series. So the next webinar in the series will be, will start to introduce more about the geopolitics and the geoeconomics of hydrogen. And we'll, ask to, we'll also try to talk more about the technical uh, introduce some technical aspects of hydrogen consumption and usage in, uh, in a country like Nigeria. How, how will it look like to consume hydrogen and use hydrogen in, uh, in a country like Nigeria? That's going to be the second uh, webinar in this series and we hope that you all can join us for that. Uh, also, I also want to let you know about some of the other activities that we are performing at the Delegation of German Industry and Commerce in Nigeria. Um, starting from the 13th to the 17th of September, we're having a digital, um, um, digital virtual delegation trip of German companies uh, coming to Nigeria to meet with uh, uh, Nigerian partners in the area of self-generation with mini grids uh, in agricultural food processing. So we hope to see all of you uh, there as well. Um, and we, as part of this project, before the, um, just because of a question that just came in, as part of this project, 
we are trying to organize a virtual roadshow. And what we hope to do with that virtual roadshow is to bring German companies and Nigerian companies who potentially can work together to develop hydrogen projects. And we are going to do uh, a project opportunity identification uh, process, which we will share with our Nigerian partners and to see whether they have potential projects that could potentially, um, uh, where they could potentially use hydrogen, whether it's uh, on-site generation, whether it's for export or something. So we, we will, we will um, communicate that with you uh, very soon. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you all uh, for attending today's event. But before I thank you all, I would like to thank uh, uh, Mrs. Halima Bauer Buari, the Director of Climate Change at the Federal Ministry of Environment. I would like to thank uh, Mrs. Comfort Emenbu. I would like to thank um, uh, Anya uh, Barretta and Dr. Solomon Ago, who have been who has been our presenter today. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. I hope you are able to join us for the next webinar in the series. Like I said, um, towards the end of September, I will communicate that with you. And I, uh, I hope you keep your interest in hydrogen because we believe that it's the, like Dr. Uh, Agbo said, it's the fuel for the future. And we look forward to welcoming you at our other events uh, at the Delegation of Germany Industry and Commerce. Thank you all and uh, have an excellent morning. It's still morning. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, Godwin. Have a good day, everyone.